South Fork, please. This is your life. This is London. We're heading for Regent Street. And yes, you did hear me correctly. I was calling for South Fork, Dallas, for the reason that there is a very, very close connection between the exotic lady behind that glamorous fashion show you got a glimpse of and the very famous character who lives in that very famous part of Texas. Hello, South Fork. Yes, coming up on my screen now, J.R. Ewing. Well, hello there, Eamon. I sure hope you pull off what you're planning over there in London. Because the lady you're after is a really big deal, as far as I'm concerned. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Well, now, we're arriving at the Café Royal, and I'm aiming to get in for the end of that uh, fashion show, Designs on Legs, because I've got designs on the uh, docker lorry driver's daughter who put punk into some of the wealthiest fashion houses in the world. But the show is not quite over, so that I can say, international fashion designer Sandra Rhodes, tonight, this is your life. That's right in the left of your jumper up there. Oh, we won't be out of the flowers, you can bring them as well. We've got some designs ourselves for you at the theatre that will surprise you. We've been working hard on them, all right? Behind you, your model girls from your show today, Designs on Legs. And of course, already on stage, uh, our fellow conspirators, your colleagues and friends, and you were a bit speechless earlier I on when I am. caught you. <laughs> as on as we can see from the newly published The Art of Zandra Rhodes, your colourful creations have taken the fashion world by storm over the past 16 years, winning you titles such as the High Priestess of Punk and more fame too. In 1973, you designed the dress Princess Anne wore for her official engagement photograph. Wherever the fashionable are seen, so often they're in clothes you've created. But I gather you don't get overexcited about it all. That's quite true. In fact, I was with you, Sandra, when you dropped off to sleep at a state dinner in Belgrade. Good friend and one of the world's top fashion models, Mary Helvin. <laughs> Mary, is Sandra falling asleep at a state banquet in uh, Yugoslavia? Yes, uh, we went there to do a fashion show for President Tito's wife and uh, the major politician's wives. And afterwards, there was a state banquet. And uh, halfway through about the second <laughs> course, I felt her leaning on me. I looked at her, and she was fast asleep. I woke her up, and she explained that she was so tired because she had been working day in and day out uh, to try and get the show together. But this is very typical of Sandra. Uh, her success is, is due not only because she's a brilliant <laughs> designer, but also because she works so hard. Thank you, Mary Helvin. <laughs> uh, 
Now, Zandra, another headline-making friend who has to be in New York tonight has also modelled your creations for the photographer's lenses to which he is no stranger. From New York, Koo Stark. Good evening, Eamon. Hello, Zandra. I'm going to tell the story of how when one of my finest moments in one of your creations nearly turned out to be my final moment, and I was sitting on top of Trump Tower being photographed in one of your ball gowns, and a great huge gust of wind came along and all of the skirts billowed out, and I nearly billowed straight off like Tinkerbell into the New York <laughs> skyline. But um, I'm glad I made it, and I'm glad you made it, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Costa in New York. Well, Sandra Rhodes, this is your life, and you were born into the world of fashion because your late mother Beatrice was a fitter at the famous Paris Fashion House of Worth and later a lecturer in fashion here. She, too, liked to dress a little, uh, well, she was extreme. She extraordinary, yes. <laughs> Did you approve? Oh, no. I used to say to her she had to... Um, I didn't want her to look so made up to come round to the school, and once I really offended her to asking her if she wouldn't wear one of the hats she'd just gone out in. <laughs> well, home was, of course, at 288 Chatham Hill, Chatham and Kent, where your father was an electrician and later a lorry driver at the Royal Naval Dockyard, so often a, a wartime target for enemy bombers. And the night of September the 19th, 1940, was no exception as bombs rained down on Chatham. What a blooming night for you to decide it was time to come into the world. <laughs> of course, your father, Albert Dusty Rhodes. <laughs> and here, too, your stepmother, Mary. <laughs> and with her husband, David, your sister, Beverly. <laughs> and their children, your nieces and nephew, Annabelle, Susanna, Charlotte, and James. Well, Dusty, as the world now knows, of course, Sandra certainly did come into the world that night of the air raid. Tell us what happened. Well, it was about midnight and she suddenly said she felt funny, we'll have to start making a move. And when I phoned up all round and I made arrangements for the taxis to turn up, no one turned up. So we had to walk two miles down Chatham Hill and all the flat and the buzz bombs and everything else, and even shrapnel all around, and people were saying, you shouldn't be walking down, come inside. We said, we haven't got a baby on the way, so we had to start moving. So when we got down, and even going down, we see one coming so low, we could see the pilot in them days. And when we got to the hospital, we discovered she'd lost both her shoes, and about two hours later, the baby was born. That was... <laughs> Yes, and there you are, Zandra, aged three months, looking pleased with the fashion you're wearing. And aged six, clearly delighted with the bow in your hair. Now, James, you're 11 years old, isn't that right? The only boy in Beverly's family, so Zandra's only nephew. Do you have any ambitions in the fashion world? Well, not really, but I would like to play for um, England in their rugby team. Maybe Auntie Zandra could um, design our um, tops. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe you might. Zandra, your sister Beverly here is three years younger and Beverly didn't. Zandra get very worried about you when you were a little girl. She thought you didn't eat enough. Yes, that's right. She always ate her food. She was very good. And she had a favourite poem she always used to recite at me that she probably would tell you, which was, Augustus was a chubby lad. Fat, chubby cheeks Augustus had, and everybody cried with joy, the fat and hearty, healthy boy. And the poem goes on, and the little boy decides he won't eat, and he gradually gets thinner and thinner until he dies. And this was her favourite poem to recite when I wouldn't eat. <laughs> She'd done it several times, so I picked up my plate full of my lunch and broke it over her head. <laughs> But it doesn't put you off your food, uh, Zandra, because one day, 35 years ago, you decided your mum deserved a treat for supper when she came home oh, from work. Right and that's when you asked me to make an extra special macaroni pudding. She often looked after you while your parents were at work when you were a little girl. You haven't seen her for 17 years. You called her Auntie Kath. Kath Brown. <laughs> Kath, those were happy days in Chatham, and you went ahead with Zandra's request for a very special macaroni pudding, right? 
Yes, but Sandra would have, but she wanted special pudding for her mum when she came home. But she didn't want an ordinary macaroni pudding, she wanted a greeny blue one. A greeny blue yes. one, yeah. Yes, <laughs> so and she would insist that I did a greeny blue one. What about when uh, her late mum came home, what did she say? Oh, she, she just looked and said, good heavens, what have I got there? <laughs> and she didn't want to eat that. She wouldn't eat it because it looked like a cabbage leaf. Well, that's what it did look like, didn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Kath Brown. <laughs> But colour certainly hasn't reached your head when you go to school at Napier Road Secondary School, then at Fort Pitt Technical School, a uh, very proper centre parting you have there. Okay. From there you go to Medway College of Art and win a scholarship to the Royal College of Art and for your finals win the gold medal. Now encouraged by a large store buying one of your prints, you form your own company designing and printing fabrics for the new wave pop culture designers of the mid-60s. Now with partner Alec McIntyre there, you rent a design studio in Soho with youthful hopes of setting the world of fashion on fire. Right, Alex? Right, uh, but unfortunately we'd only half moved in and the whole building went up in flames. Uh, luckily, just the equipment was damaged, so we had to move out back to Bayswater and we've been there for the last 20 years. And it was exactly 20 years ago you went to a party where you were to meet someone who was to become a close friend. She glances across the room and can't help but notice you. That was probably because of your navy blue hair and black and white checks painted all over your eyes. <laughs> close friend to this day, journalist and television presenter, Janet Street Potter. <laughs> Well, Janet, it certainly does sound as if uh, you couldn't uh, miss Sandra at that part. Yeah, and it's hard to believe because my hair was silver. <laughs> I was <laughs> like a kind of retiring violet next to her. She took my breath away. <laughs> and we became very great friends, Eamon. And a few years later, I had to go to one of those great big awards dinners, the kind of thing you see on TV all the time where you have to get dressed up to the nines. And she lent me one of her very special own dresses. And it was in a bit of a, um, what's the word? It wasn't quite worked out. It was about nine, pe nine yards of fabric that you wrapped around and it looked absolutely amazing. It looked great on Zandra. It looked great on me when she put it on. Of course, I had to go to the loo, didn't I? In the interval, I rushed into the loo when the television camera stopped, rushed into the loo, and the only way to go to the loo was to unwrap the dress. I couldn't get it back on again, and all these famous ladies came in the loo with me. I said, no, I think it goes like this, Janet. But, uh, yeah, I was trapped in the loo for quite some time, but the dress was wonderful. Thank you, Janet Street Porter. Well, Sandra, since those days, many a famous face has been only too happy to be seen in your creations, not the least of whom is a pal currently starring on television in New York, where she has to be tonight, but from whom you made a special gown for the opening night of this film in which she co-starred Superman 3. you never get here. Keep looking at that screen, Zandra, because coming up from New York now, who else but Pamela Stevenson. Hi, Eamon, and hi, Zandra. How are you? It was great to see you in New York a few weeks ago. It was so funny when I was standing on the edge of the street and you leapt out of the biggest black limousine in the world and screeched my name. And, uh, and then you came into the studio where I'm, I'm making this TV show here and, and everyone wanted to know who the extremely exotic looking woman with the pink hair was. Thank you for the dress. It fits me perfectly. And it was so kind of you to send it to me. Um, I love the back. It's so rude. <laughs> um, I know that there'll be lots of people wishing you well. So I'll add my wishes to theirs and say that it's, it's really nice to have you as a friend. We've loved having you over to our place, parties and things. You're a party animal. <laughs> night, night. Have a good time. Thank you. Pamela Stevenson. <laughs> well, Sandra, long before you became fashion designer to the stars, one day in 1969, you went along to an internationally famous store in London's West End to show them your work. The store's fashion executive comes out of her office to take a look. I might say you could have knocked me down with the proverbial feather, including the feathers in her hair. She launched you into the world of high fashion, that same executive, Anne Knight. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, what exactly did you see when you came out of your office to look at Sandra uh, and her collection? Well, her appearance was absolutely amazing. And, uh, I hardly imagine how she got into the store, actually. She was wearing satin knickerbockers, a transparent chiffon blouse. Uh, her face was striped with colour. Her hair was street green with feathers on the end. I think there must have been a few raised eyebrows that day, Sandra. <laughs> you were hardly the Fortnum Mason image. <laughs> But her collection was ravishing. Marvellous chiffons in beautiful colours, completely new shapes, exquisitely made, and I bought the lot on the spot. But what I recognised immediately was that this is no girl eccentric with coloured hair. She's a true professional, she's a perfectionist, she's absolutely original, and she's got an amazing, amazing talent. Thank you, and night. Nice. Uh, launched thanks to Anne on the London fashion scene, your next conquest has to be New York. And it's there you head in 1969 with a letter of introduction to someone with the daunting title of the High Priestess of Fashion. Because in those days of the late 1960s, she was the editor-in-chief of American Vogue. And it's from New York, where today she has the prestigious post of Special Consultant for the Costume Department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the High Priestess herself, Diana Vreeland. Good evening, Iman. It's wonderful to be here. I'm so looking forward to seeing Zandra. Now, we're going to talk about you. You see, Zandra, you're a personality. You're an idealist. You're a person with the greatest sense of color. You've got so many facets to your extraordinary career. When I think of the marvelous things that you've done, the independence that you've sh shown, because idealists can have ideas, but to put them across as something, you've always succeeded. You've always done it too beautifully. Thank you, Diana Vreeland in New York. Well, Alexandra, as we've heard, your very distinctive hairdos have always stamped you out in the crowd. That's right, and not only in the crowd. He should know because it was he who first executed the change from brunette to green and subsequently the whole tonsorial rainbow, international hairstylist Leonard. <laughs> Fine. How do you mean she wasn't only stamped out in the crowd with those hairdos? Well, Sandra took everything for granted. I remember the first time she went to New York. She got on a bus and she got off and she saw me and everybody said, why is everybody looking at me, Len? Because she calls me Len, you see. <coughs> and I said, well, if you don't know, nobody will. Then another time, we're in the middle of Australia and she went to Ayers Rock. And we met later and we had a drink. She said, they're very funny out here. She said, you know, I went sunbathing in the nude, and they recognised me. Mine now. She had bright green hair at the time. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Leonard. You. Thank you. <laughs> well, Zandra, Australia, New York, and Paris too. Your creations have captured the imaginations of women in the fashion centres of the world, starting in 1965, right up to a peak of fame 20 years on. And we can see your latest collection, shown here by international fashion models, Zandra Rose, 1985. Designs like those have brought the world's famous to your doors and sometimes they've become not only valued clients but friends too. And as we're talking of people in high places, they don't come any more powerful than the friend of yours we're going to hear from now. He's in 
Where else? Dallas. J.R. Ewing himself, Larry Hagman, and his real-life wife, Mai. Hi, Zandra. I sure am glad Amy got a hold of you. I sure wish we could be with you, but Larry's still shooting Dallas. Yeah. Uh, remember uh, a couple of years ago we had Christmas dinner together? Well, now, maybe this year you can come down to Dallas and have it with us. Say, listen, why don't you dye your hair green to match all the money I make, honey? <laughs> sure hope you're having a nice evening there. And I also wish my dress could be there. It usually goes all over the world, and it's gone as many miles as I have, I think. Yeah, this is really a beauty, isn't it? It's her favorite dress. Cocktail, dinner, breakfast, you name it. <laughs> have a good time, sweetie. Thank you, Mai. I'm Larry Hagman. Zandra, as we've heard, despite all the international glamour, you set yourself such a punishing work rate that holidays are few and far between these days. But we came across these holiday snaps taken nearly 30 years ago in St. Andra in Laventhal in Austria. You were a guest in this house where you were made to feel a member of the family and couldn't wait to return again to be with your new friends. And also to eat your favorite Austrian sweet meat. Remember, made by our mother, Especially for you. That same Austrian brother and sister who became like brother and sister to you 30 years ago. Eric Schipek and Frau Gundel von Drack. <laughs> Sandra Rhodes, international fashion designer, this is your life. <laughs> 